a signal to you guys. How about some more applause for these fantastic <laughs> questions, grab them, have a beer with them out back. Um, there is coffee, help yourself. What I'd like to do is transition uh, the meeting and get Todd from Twalton Valley Fire and Rescue up here. Uh, excuse me, Twalton oh, Valley Water District. Yeah, We've got right, a yeah. lot of Twaltons up here. And uh, I want to thank uh, both uh, um, Tom from uh, uh, TriMet and uh, Todd from the Water District to come out and, uh, and help us. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, Todd's uh, done a number of presentations, but um, one of the things that, that I was passionate about was making sure that people understood the decisions that were being made about sourcing the water uh, for the future, especially since we've got so many build-outs of the community that really you guys need to have a, um, a chance to understand what decisions are being made. So that's uh, Todd's job here, and uh, um, what I'd like to do is just ask you to give uh, Todd uh, would you help me with your last Hi Gherkin? That's a tough one. It's Hi Gherkin. Okay. Hi to a Gherkin. Todd. <laughs> Here's Todd. How about some applause? Well, thank you, Eric. And, you know, it's, it's fun to be part of a meeting where not only do you have great stacks, and, but you also learn about some important causes like wiping out polio and, and how to save people's lives with... Uh, with CPR, and so what a, what a great meeting. My compliments to, to you, Eric, and, and I also appreciate all of you for taking the time to come out this evening, uh, and for the opportunity to share a little bit about, about your water supply and your water future, and some of the things that the 12th Valley Water District uh, is actively working on, and some decisions that we're going to be making later this month. Before I start, I want to make sure that I introduce a few folks uh, in the audience. Uh, of course, I'm Todd Heigerkin, and I manage our community and intergovernmental relations department. With me is, is Jim Morado. He's uh, really been doing a lot of the, the heavy lifting as it relates to helping us uh, put on these meetings, reach out to the public, and it's been a, a real uh, benefit to making sure that folks are aware of what's taking place. Also in the back is one of our, our board president, Commissioner Dick Schmidt. Uh, so he's, he's one of the guys that gets to help make the decisions. So I'm going to tell you about some of the things that the district's uh, working on, but he's the one that gets the big bucks to, to help make, make that decision. And then, uh, not to put him on the spot, but we also have Andrew Carlson, who's uh, actually a new budget committee member for TBWD. So although he's not part of the decision-making process as it relates to our water supply, he is obviously going to have a role in as it relates to our budget, budget development efforts that are currently underway. <coughs> so. Um, with that, what I want to accomplish tonight is, is to hopefully get, give you an overview of, of water supply planning and, and the need for it. We'll talk a little bit about what it is our existing supplies are, so we kind of get all to the same, same level of background. And then talk about some of the things that the district is working on and the criteria and, and how we're evaluating this, and then tell you how you can provide some feedback in that process. So I think it's so appropriate that we're meeting here at TBFNR because I think it just helps illustrate the point that so many times we take water for granted. Uh, as long as it comes out of our tap or we can flush our toilets or we can turn on the faucet and water our lawns, uh, it's just kind of one of those things that, that we always assume that it's going to be there, it's going to be there in enough quantity and it's going to be a safe and helpful, helpful product. And so I think that's good. That's what we want you to, to experience and want you to feel. But I think it's also important to note that the importance of water uh, to the community as a whole. In fact, this morning I had an opportunity to, to listen to the, the State of the County address with uh, Chair Dyke delivering that. And, and he made a comment that I thought was very true, where a lot of times we describe Washington County as the economic engine um, of, of the region. But the fuel that that engine runs on is water. And I couldn't have... Uh, uh, said it better as far as the importance of water to our community, not only obviously for our own use, but also for the use of business. I mean, think of a, could you have an Intel or a Research Fine Foods or any of those type of businesses within our organism, within our community without an adequate supply of water. It's also important that we make sure that uh, we look at the importance of like fire protection. Again, I said it's appropriate that we're here talking at TBFNR given the, the uh, the role that water has, obviously, with, uh, with fire protection and making sure that our communities are safe in that regard. 
And then obviously there's the healthful aspect. I mean, nobody has the concerns if you've ever had an opportunity to travel uh, in maybe uh, some other countries where the water wasn't safe. Uh, you know, that's just not a concern here. And that's one of the things we want to make sure that we're always providing. So our mission at TBWD is to provide our customers with quality water and customer service. And so that's what we'll, we'll kind of incorporate as we go through this presentation time. So just real quick background. Uh, if you're not familiar with Twelve Valley Water District, we actually serve over 200,000 people uh, through about 60,000 60, connections. The district itself was formed in 1991 at the merger of two districts, so you'll notice there's kind of two distinct segments of the district. The larger portion is what we call the Wolf Creek Highway Water District portion, and then the, the lower portion to the right is that of the Metzger Water District. And so those are the two two organizations that were formed. We encompass about 45 square miles and uh, actually touch and serve portions of the city of Beaverton, Hillsboro, and Tiger, and then all the different communities within unincorporated Washington County uh, in between those, those areas as well. And we provide water to our customers through a series of about 739 miles or over 730 miles of pipe that uh, delivers, on average, about 22 million gallons a day to, to all of you. This is, I think, one important thing to note is when, when we talk about the pipes, um, one of the things that a lot of people probably don't realize is in many instances, the size of the pipe is, is not sized in order to meet the needs of your personal use, but out of many times it's sized in order to meet the needs of fire flow, to make sure that there's adequate water to uh, satisfy the hydrants. Now, in our service area, we have a number of different uh, businesses that are an important part, and important to our customer base. And actually, if you look at it from a water usage standpoint, a little less than a third of our water supply is actually used by businesses, not, not just these, but a variety of, of businesses within the service area. It's important to note, though, if you look at our entire customer base as far as a percentage, uh, our non-residential customers only make up about 8% 8, 8 of our district. So the bulk of our customers are actually people like you, people with residents, uh, people that are relying on our water for their own personal use. But I want to note, as far as the usage, obviously the business businesses are a critical component of that. So the real question is, is why are we talking about future water supply? Well, the first thing I want to do is assure you that where we're at today is in a good position. I'm not coming to you with a crisis. I'm not telling you we're, we're, we're out of water or anything like that. In fact, we're benefiting from a variety of things, one of which was good sound planning early on. Second thing that I'll talk a little bit more about was a strong conservation effort in order to kind of extend the life of our current water supplies. However, that doesn't give us a pass as far as not preparing for that next increment. I think some of these numbers, I don't know if you may have seen these in other, used by other folks, but we figure within TBWD we're going to have about 82,000 additional, additional in folks within our service area by 2042. Now, of course, along with people, hopefully have businesses and jobs and further opportunities, and all of those folks and all those businesses are also going to be reliant on a stable supply of water. So we want to look ahead in order to do that. I was pointing out to somebody, it's kind of interesting, this slide here, it shows our current peak day demands, and right now it's, it was about 40 million gallons last year, which was which a fairly low number for us in normal. If I was given this presentation seven years ago, it would have been about 50. Uh, so I think there's, there's a variety of things that are in play there. Again, our strong conservation program. And then plus, uh, let's face it, there's I think some things like the, the downturn in the economy recently. Uh, has has shaved that peak demand. But one of the things we need to be prepared for is what happens when uh, growth starts to occur again and the economy takes off, and we want to be ready, ready for that. So as far as our current supply today, I want to quickly orient you. We really have two main sources of supply, one on the west, one on the west, east. I got my directions <laughs> right. Uh, the east is a supply where we purchase water from the city of Portland. Our west supply is we're a partner in the Joint Water Commission along with the cities of Beaverton, Hillsboro, and Forest Grove. We're, we're a part owner in that facility that has a 
water treatment plants uh, outside of Forest Grove. We also, a third, it's not really a source of supply, but it's been an extremely useful tool to allow us to kind of manage the supply as, as aquifer storage and recovery. And that's using those wells. And that is an instance where you're taking water when it's plentiful in the water and the winter, uh, pumping that water into the ground, using it as a giant uh, reservoir. And then in the summer, when you have those demands and the water supply is, is less abundant, then you pump that water out. We actually have been able to, to uh, uh, store about 300 million gallons of water in the ground, and so over a 100-day period, that allows us to pull out 3 million gallons a day uh, over that period, which has been extremely valuable uh, in order to manage our water supply, especially, obviously, in the, in the summer. So the important thing to note is we envision that all these supplies, in some form or fashion, will continue uh, in the future, and so these have been, these have been stable supplies. Now, one of the things that the district has been doing is making sure that we're preparing for this decision that's coming up, and we'll continue to prepare for that. And so, so we've tried to make sure that we're kind of saving up money for our down payment, just like you would for a house or for a car or, or however you, <coughs> whatever example you want to give. But what we've been able to do is, is you can see that, that our rates are kind of right in the middle of the pack if you look at it from a regional perspective. So that's, that's kind of how we've been trying to approach making sure we're developing these reserves for this decision, but also trying to manage our rate expectations as well. So I've mentioned conservation a few times, and I want to make sure that I'm really stressing. As I talk about water supply in the future, one of the things that, that is just always going to be part of any component as we move forward is water conservation. I've already talked about the success of the district has achieved with respect to that. We've had an opportunity to provide a lot of incentives to our customers. Uh, and the results, I think, are telling. I mean, the fact that our gallons per capita per day, so how much each person would use on average per day, has decreased about 16% since 2005. In fact, we're experiencing the lowest gallons per capita per day that we've ever had for the district. And so I think that shows some success, some success there. Now the benefit of that is this water supply decision that we're making, this has enabled us to kind of delay that decision a little bit and still work off our remaining supplies. The challenge is it's gonna be this aggressive conservation and the progress that we've made, we're not sure how well we can continue to drive that down. It's, it's gonna to get tougher and tougher in the future. So let's talk about what's being considered as far as our future water supply. There's actually four options that the board is looking at. And I'll just quickly go through, through each of them. Uh, the A water drop is, uh, is, uh, is around Hag Lake. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that, with, with Hag Lake and Scoggins, Scoggins Dam. That would involve the expansion of Hag Lake. Uh, it's also known as the Walton Basin Water Supply Project. We're calling it our, our you know, just increase in the storage of Hag Lake. That project would obviously require us to increase the dam height of Hag Lake. We'd also have a, a raw water uh, pipe that would go from clear from the Hag Lake down to the uh, Joint Water Commission water treatment plant, and there there'd be some additional improvements associated with that, uh, like a pumping pumping station and so on. So that's, a, that's one of the, the options uh, that we're looking at. And it's probably one that you've heard a lot about because it's been um, discussed quite a bit uh, early on. In fact, in 2007, the Tualatin Valley Water District made the decision that that was really our preferred source alternative. I'll go into a little bit of a reason why we're, we're reevaluating that decision at this point and looking at these other options. The second source is what we're calling our nor northern groundwater option. And really what that does is look at a series of collector wells that are um, outside of the Scappoose area, kind of in that, along the Columbia River. And this would be a source that would involve, obviously, a number of wells, it would involve uh, some treatment associated with that, and then a pumping station and a pipeline to get it from Scappoose over the hill and into the district. So those are the components of that, that option. The third is a mid Willamette option. So that's looking at, at expanding the existing Willamette River water treatment plant that's in Wilsonville that uses the Willamette as a river as a source of supply. That's the same treatment plant that's currently used by the city of Wilsonville and the city of Sherwood. 
So that would involve expanding that facility and also developing a pipeline that goes from Wilsonville up into the district service area uh, and in order to, to address that. And then there's other components as far as a reservoir and so on. And then last but not least is to expand one of the district's current sources, and that being uh, purchasing water from the city of Portland. And Portland gets its water primarily from the Bull Run watershed, but then also uses to augment uh, its water supply with the Columbia South Shore well field. This is an option that, that would involve us being in a longer term contract with the city of Portland, and would also involve uh, the development or the construction of a second, what we're calling the Washington County supply line. We currently have the, a Washington County supply line that provides water from Powell Butte Reservoir all the way uh, into the district, um, long pipeline that goes through town and under the Willamette River, and over the hills and into the district. Quite, quite, a, quite an interesting project. So that that project would involve expanding that that uh, that option right now. I think one of the things to note here before we move on is is the fact that that whatever we do, we're looking for partnering opportunities because what we have found out, I think examples like the Joint Water Commission are excellent. Uh, examples of how when you partner together you can you can achieve more and you can manage costs and, and it's just a better allocation of resources. Fall Valley Water District has really valued its partnerships and valued the opportunity to to uh, work with with other water providers in the area in order to make good use of, of our resources in that regard. Now the big question is is you know, how is the board going to make the decision? Well, obviously there's a financial component to it, but there's a lot of non-financial things that need to be considered as well. And it's up here as a, a list of some of the water supply planning criteria that the board is using uh, to look at the different options and, and have been asking a lot of questions and uh, have been reviewing a variety of information with that. You can read the list, but I just want to highlight a few of them. Obviously water quality, that's, you know, the product we provide our customer. That's an area we're not compromising in at all. Uh, again, I talked about our mission is to provide our customers with quality water and customer service, so we're not gonna do anything that jeopardizes, jeopardizes that commitment to you. The second thing is obviously, I mentioned the cost and the rate impact. Obviously, all these different projects have significant costs, which we'll talk a little bit about uh, in, a, in a few slides, but it's important to note that we're, we're trying to manage those. However, that's not gonna be the sole decision we make, but it is obviously going to be a, a, a factor to consider. One of the things that's popped up on the list is redundancy. And and let me tell you, the district, Fulton Valley Water District is a little bit unique where we have multiple sources of supply. And that has been invaluable uh, to the district, especially to meet instances where maybe one of our sources wasn't available uh, in times of drought. Uh, and, you know, just given some of the challenges as far as managing and and moving around water, it's been a very useful tool. And it's a tool now I think that folks like the city of Hillsborough are realizing more and more uh, that they can't be as reliant on a single source of supply. So you want to keep that in mind. And then, and plus, I mean, you, you hear a lot of things that have taken place about some of the, the natural disasters or natural uh, concerns that we need to be prepared for. I mean, we hear a lot about uh, the big earthquake that's, that will be happening, and that's even a more concern given the fact that one of our sources of, supply, sources of supply is the Joint Water Commission, which relies on water from two dams. Um, these are all things that, that are playing into this category as well. Obviously, public and business acceptance want to make sure that it's a source that's acceptable to uh, our customers, but it's also a, a source that meets the needs of our business businesses. We have a few high-tech businesses within our water, um, water district that, that they rely on a consistent quality supply of water, and so we want to make sure that we're meeting that need. And then one that might sound a little odd is for, especially for a public agency, is the ownership or control issue. Uh, you know, the opportunity for us to be involved in the decision making or and helping to make the decisions as far as how the source of supply is developed, how the assets are maintained, uh, and, and just what we're doing uh, as good stewards of our assets is one of those things that uh, we want to make sure is being considered as well. Because that helps us control things like rate impacts, uh, you know, treatment options, and, and to make sure that we're, we're complying with our commitment to our customers. 
So I want to go through the four options, just give you a little bit more flavor for, for some of the, the, the challenges and opportunities associated with those two. First off, with respect to the increased storage at Hague Lake, you know, the nice thing is, is it's an existing source that we're familiar with. And so we know it has good water quality. We're familiar with the Drunk Water Commission water treatment plant and how it operates. Um, we've got a good partnership with, with others in the community on that. But the real challenge here is probably something, again, you've heard probably a lot about in the news, and that's the whole seismic issue as it relates to, to Scoggins Dam. And some of the challenges associated with that, uh, we're now we're being asked to plan for that for that facility to withstand the cascading of the subduction zone earthquake, which is an extremely difficult standard uh, for, for a facility like that to meet. And then, well, would need to increase the size of that dam beyond that, beyond that instance. The other challenging part about that is, is since uh, we've been studying this more, there's been a threatened and endangered species that have been identified in the area that would be inundated. And so that provides some additional federal uh, federal endangered species challenges associated with that. And then <clears throat> the dam, I should point out, is a federal facility. And so uh, this is one of those instances where we're literally, in order to do some of these things, it takes an act of Congress in order to do it. And that's one of these things we joke about, but in this instance, it's true. And so that's a, that's a challenge itself. And so the real question is, and one of the reasons why TBWD is in the process of kind of reevaluating that 2007 decision is because we've learned a lot since then. A lot of new information has come out. But then second, um, you know, we're concerned about the timing. Is, can the federal government go through that process and, and can they be a partner in this project in a manner that's going to meet our needs? Now, with all that said, I don't want to discount the fact that no matter what TBWD ends up doing, it's very important that uh, we work with the federal government and to make sure that existing structure is, is safer and sounder and, and meets the needs of, that communi of our community because it still is an important resource for our community. It will continue to be a water resource, it will continue to be a, a water quality resource uh, for agencies like Clean Water Services, an important recreational opportunity, and then obviously all the different acre, uh, irrigated acres that are result from that facility as well. Second, I'll go through a little bit quicker, uh, northern groundwater. One of the pluses about that is this would be a third source to the district. We've learned the value of multiple sources, and so this would be a, kind of a third leg of that stool. Uh, so that's attractive from that standpoint. The ownership opportunity, I kind of identified that as one of the criteria. This would be something we would own. We would be able to control and manage, and so we could try to do that in a manner that we feel is responsible to our customers. And then, uh, it also, you know, is, is a reliable supply. There's a lot of water in that area. But on the flip side, it's also an area that there's not a whole lot of large-scale large water development in that area. So there is some unknowns associated with that. It is next to the Columbia River, so there's a lot of Columbia River influence associated with that. There would also be some treatment requirements associated with that. And then from a sustainability or energy and energy consumption standpoint, it's a real challenging because not only you're pumping it to get out of the ground, but you're actually having to pump it uh, over the hill in order to get to the district. And so it's kind of one of the higher higher areas um, and one of the more challenging aspects from an energy perspective. The third is the Mid Willamette. Uh, this is this is a, a you know a, a facility that has been in operation now for almost 11 years has been serving the community of Wilsonville for that period of time. Uh, over those years, we've learned a lot about the finished water quality. Uh, it provides an opportunity for the district, again, to have that ownership interest. And in fact, we, we have uh, an ownership interest currently in that facility, although we have no, no uh, infrastructure in place to connect that system up uh, into the district. And so this would, this would involve a variety of those things. But, as with most of the other uh, options as well, it does have some implementation risk. I mean, we're talking about an extensive um, <clears throat> pipeline that's gonna impact uh, probably seven different, seven to eight communities along the way. Uh, and so it has some implementation risks associated with that. And then the last one that I always wanna mention is out of our, our purchasing additional water from, from Portland. 
Now the first bullet point talks about right size. And everybody's probably just thinking, what in the world's that? Mean? What's what's right sized options? Well, the nice thing is, is for a lot of these other options that we're talking about, we're talking about developing large infrastructure projects right up front in order to meet the needs, uh, not only now, but in the future. With Portland, it does provide a little bit of an opportunity to kind of grow into that supply. Uh, it's also an untreated supply, so you're not dealing with expansions of water treatment plants. Uh, obviously, it's, it's a wonderfully protected watershed, so it's a beautiful source. Uh, however, um, it does provide some concerns as it relates to kind of the ownership and control. We are, uh, you know, we're a customer of Portland. And so what <laughs> Portland decides is what we get. If Portland decides that they don't want to treat the water for cryptosporidium and they want to pursue a variance, we don't have no say in that. We just get the same water uh, that Portland will, will do. Obviously, for some of our customers that rely on a, a real consistent quality water, um, that sometimes is a, is a concern because since it is an unfiltered source, it has a little bit of variation. Um, but it's been, a, it's been a great water source that, that we've, we've used for a number of years. The one challenge, though, is, is it's already our main source of supply. So it doesn't add any redundancy. So if we have a problem in the, with the Portland supply, that's going to have a significant impact uh, on the district. And so that's an important component. Well, let's talk about money. And this is not a very popular slide to show. But what we what I wanted to point out here is that we're looking at we're looking at these different supply options a variety of different ways. So we're looking at the the uh, kind of the present value aspect. So if you look at what it takes to build the project and operate it over an extended like a 50-year period of time and you lump those all together. This is what you're looking at now. We're not asking people for a billion, billion dollars, okay, uh, at, at this point. But over spread over a 50-year period, this is going to be all these projects are going to be fairly significant in order to meet the needs of the future. We're also looking at it from a risk analysis. So obviously, there's a lot of assumptions that go into this, and so we're looking at the risks of those assumptions and see which project we feel that we can deliver within a narrow risk uh, band there. And, and so that's another way we're looking at it. And then third, we're looking at it at the rate of cut. I mean, let's face it, that's what you, our customers, are probably more concerned about as far as what is this gonna do with respect to rates. And so that's another analysis uh, that we're going through and, and looking at it. Now these are some planning level estimates, and, and so you can see you know, the, the, the increase in Hag Lake and the northern groundwater and the purchasing more water from Portland are kind of the, in that same realm uh, and then the Willamette is a little bit, a little bit less. But I want to stress these are planning estimates, so there's a lot of variability within them. So I wouldn't. Uh, they're good for kind of looking at as a comparison basis, but I wouldn't get as fixated uh, on the numbers. So where are we at? Well, we've been in a process of, of doing a variety of different meetings and reaching out to folks, and and really what it is is we, we want to get your feedback and an opportunity for, for you to ask questions, uh, an opportunity for you to also provide feedback. I think Jim has handed out uh, some feedback forms that you're welcome to fill out, either now or mail them in, or it's available online, uh, or you can email us, or whatever's convenient for you, uh, to provide that feedback. Now, the challenge is, is a decision is, is pending. Uh, it's coming up pretty quick. In fact, the board, of, the board of Commissioners has a meeting scheduled for April 24th, and the plan is, is for them to make a decision on a, on a preferred alternative uh, at that meeting. So they've been going through, uh, uh, <laughs> how many meetings have we run you through? I know. It's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, there's been a number of different work sessions that we've held uh, where we've uh, been providing our, the, the Board of Commissioners with a considerable amount of information, all of which is available on our website. So if you want to get into the gory details, uh, we have all the different uh, uh, presentations and then we're always available by phone call. So I want you to, to kind of be aware of, of, of that opportunity. And ultimately, it's going to be the decision of our, of our Board of Commissioners. Uh, staff has prepared the information. Uh, we have provided them with all the, the customer input from this point, And they get to balance and weigh this and, and make the decisions and go from there. In conclusion, I just kind of want to stress it was 
it was interesting where you talked about the historical society, the low historical society, and I just, I, I thought about kind of the role of the district in this community, and in fact, Jim and I were talking about, gosh, we may have some good information for you and some different different resources and stuff. And I think the thing that, that strikes me is, this is kind of a, well, not kind of, this is a historical decision. And if you look at the fact that we're benefiting from decisions that were made literally over a decade ago, I mean, a uh, hundred years ago, uh, with respect to using the Portland supply. We're benefiting from decisions that were made, what, 30 years ago, as it relates to uh, raising, uh, <coughs> um, creating Scoggins Dam and Hag Lake. You know, this is, this is what, another one of these, these milestones uh, within our community and within what we're taking place, with what's taking place with respect to solidifying and assuring that we have a reliable water future. So, with that, I will close. I don't. Five minutes of questions. That's that's great. Whatever you have time for, I want to be. Well, sensitive. then I want the first one. Oh boy. Um, uh, I'm going to press this. Start giving one of those. <laughs> uh, uh, comment is that uh, uh, we're transitioning. Looks like excluding this decision is an, uh, uh, an inclusion of more aquifer storage and recovery supply on Cooper Mountain, which I live on. There's two matters that concern me with that. One is that we had an expansion of the quarry proposed, which I perceive to be a potential impact because the aquifer has been breached at least twice to my knowledge, um, uh, and we have artifacts of that around our community. Urbanization uses more pesticides per square acre than rural areas, and what uh, um, my concern is, is that with that, that transition, South Cooper Mountain, uh, for example, uh, we're now going to be uh, putting some additional strains in the aquifer storage and recovery supply expansion. Um, so that's that's my comment. And it uh, seems like uh, uh, my, my question is that, uh, you don't have to answer it, but it just looks like a game of bluff that uh, we're gonna say, we're gonna you know drill the pipe and Portland sign a 20 year contract and give us cheap water so we don't have to. <laughs> and that, that's, that's my take, but uh, um, uh, do you see a, a um, you know a, per, uh, a perceived leaning of the board and the, the decision towards the uh, mid Willamette supply option? Does that just kind of look like the, the best alternative? Yeah, as far I mean, I can. I Dick, do you want to take try that to one? to that. Yeah. Uh, okay. The, the the Columbia well field. I don't know how interested the public is going to be to drink water downstream from the Portland Harbor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or Hanford. Even, yeah, or Hanford, yeah. Even if we do treat it, the perception is still there. The wolves in the dark. You know, yeah. Easy to find when you're thirsty. <laughs> and Hague Lake, with the seismic issues and the fact that the federal government is involved in it, doesn't leave us a lot of confidence that anything is going to happen in a reasonable amount of time with that. Okay, that leaves Portland, which. I'm just, you know, I keep in the back of my head, what if there's a forest fire in the Bull Run watershed? Or what if there's a landslide and it goes down and we end up with one source of water? And so that's basically why we're leaning toward the Milano. Uh That's the most prudent decision. Excellent. Take those two questions, and, and then if you want to speak to your commissioner, he's right here, <laughs> one of five, and uh, uh, Todd would probably hang out and chat with you too. So, uh, Lyles and uh, Steve, which, which has the um, which option has the most capacity for? Because you know we're we're expanding here in the area, and Portland's going to be expanding too, and so they're going to need their water too. And it sounds to me like the uh, Willamette would have the most capacity. Yeah, I mean, tapping into one of the largest rivers in the country, and then we actually already, through a partnership with the Willamette River Water Coalition, already have water rights to, to 130 million gallons a day of water. So that's a significant quantity of water. Um, you know, so there's, there's, and there's 13 federal reservoirs that store, I can bore you with numbers, 1.6 million acre feet of water that's, that's stored every, every uh, summer in those reservoirs. That's ultimately released, uh, and we're the farthest downstream point from those reservoirs. So, so there's a lot of uh, reliability with respect to that source. Uh, with the 
with the well field, again, it's a little bit unproven. We think there's all, uh, it's a pretty reliable source of that, but uh, some other concerns that we're talking about. Portland, you're kind of, you know, I don't, I don't see a third low run dam ever going up in, in that watershed. And so what you've got, I think, is, is where it's at. Uh, and then, um, in fact, one of the components of the 12 Basin Water Supply Project is what we're calling a raw water pump back. So you'd actually pump water in the winter from the Tuolumne River up into the reservoir to help improve its reliability. So you're, you're limited once once you're once you built it, you're done on that. So um, yeah, based on your question, and I think you're, that's pretty perceptive as far as the Willamette probably has the most expandability of any of the three so the four sources we're looking at. Thanks. I had. Uh, Maybe a two-pronged question. One was also on the mid Willamette was, is there any uh, liability implications of removing, if we rely on that one more heavily than it is now, Wilsonville and Sherwood being the only users now, um, is there any liability about taking water out of the Willamette? I'm thinking about people who use the Willamette farther downstream, like the city of Portland. You know, I mean, part of their sewer <coughs> treatment formula is based on how big the Willamette is, you know, how big's the puddle they're pouring their poop into. The great question, again, we're talking about such a significant flow of water that I, I talked about a, a huge quantity as far as the water right, you know, with 130 million gallons a day. There's still Is not that big. huge, but in comparison to that river, it, you can't even measure that. Okay. And so, so the impact on that. So now, there shouldn't be any liability downstream. Okay, the other question was quickly with, I mean, everybody's concerned about Scoggins Dam and the, uh, and I keep thinking about what around here has been through these earthquakes before, and the West Hills has been through these earthquakes how, who knows how many times, and um, why I think my theory on why it survived is a big pile of boulders, and I'm wondering if, um, you know, it's immovable, it moves, and I'm wondering if there's any, been any engineering done about uh, a Scoggins Dam that had some movability to it with some sort of flexible face to it, you know what I mean? Yeah, there's actually been, um, there's a corrective action study, there's actually been a, lot of, a considerable amount of engineering work that's looked at that. One of the fundamental issues associated with that, with that dam is when it was constructed, uh, the core of that dam didn't go all the way down to the bedrock. Instead it went down a certain amount and then it was on a, kind of more of the soil and then the bedrock. And so the problem is, is with the type of earthquake that we're talking, that liquefaction occurs, and so that that soil layer just right, goes dissipates. Away. And yeah. so it's not it's not a function of it's literally a function of the dam flattening out. Right. Um, well, I was thinking though, that if they built a new dam, it would be um, it would you know to raise the level, you'd supersede the old dam that's going to liquefy. I like your thinking, but convincing the federal government. Yeah, exactly. Is I know. You're trying to be too practical. <laughs> that's a lot of money too. Yeah. yeah. And, and another thing, uh, the last subduction main zone earthquake was uh, in the year 1700. Mm -hmm. So no dams have ever experienced that before. Yeah, no dams. You know, yeah. uh, except maybe some ice dams <laughs> yeah, somewhere. Right. Well, and but I'm thinking that there are natural features that have been through it around here oh, that yeah. did make it because they did move. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah, this dam's going to move. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, interesting to see that the other day they're saying that the Columbia River dams are safe yeah. from the subduction. I don't know how they figure that. Well, Bonneville and the North End. All right. I'm going to say How about some applause yeah. for Todd? Yeah. 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 Really big decisions coming up. And also uh, some big decisions. Uh, there's some stuff going on at TriMet. Uh, waiting patiently has been Mr. Tom Mills, who has a last name that's a little bit easier to pronounce than Todd's. However, um, I would also ask you to keep your hands nice and warm and give Mr. Mills some applause for being here as well. Soak it up while you can get it. Great, thank you. Uh, and that uh, I'd say, uh, folks, uh, you need to use the restroom down there to the left or to the right. I think it's to the left. And uh, Tom, take it away. Thank it's you, yours. Eric. I appreciate it. Uh, once again, my name is Tom Mills. I am a planner with TriMet. Um, I, pardon me, I've got this here. Uh, I'm here to, today to talk to you about uh, what we call the Westside Service Enhancement Plan. 
And I don't know uh, how many of you were here about a year ago or so, um, and I came uh, to this same group and talked to you about how we were kicking off the plan and uh, you know some of the uh, process that we were going to go through. And I think I even asked some of you guys, you know, yeah, what are some of your ideas? How would you like to see service uh, change? And so a year later, uh, we've had a lot of conversations with the community. We've done a lot of demographic work. Uh, and we have some recommendations, and I'm, I'm kind of doing the outreach process now to uh, hear from folks about what they think. Now, the first thing I want to point out on this is it says March 1st is your deadline. Ignore that. I will always take comments uh, on the plan. Uh, but let me back up a little bit and, and tell you, remind you a little bit about what the plan was, what would, where did it come from, and why are we doing it, etc. So. Uh, for those of you who have been following it, uh, TriMet, uh, we had a change in leadership uh, almost two years ago now. Um, our general manager today is named Neil McFarland, and, and he challenged us. He said, look guys, I know that we're in a recession. I know that we have a lot of internal cost structure problems, uh, but we also know that uh, the Port Portland metropolitan area is growing uh, rapidly, and uh, we're going to need to meet that. Uh, and one day we are going to get out of this recession, and we've got to start planning now about where we want those funds to go. Uh, because not everything that you know, we recently cut is going to come back. In fact, a lot of things that were cut, uh, you know, were, were lines that people really weren't using. So how can we better use that money? Um, so that was 